Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. I'd like to thank the FT for hosting this and all of you for taking time out of your lunch hour. Um, you know, we're here in uh, Frobisher Hall. Um, seems, seems to me that everything in the world is, is connected, uh, being here in Frobisher Hall. Frobisher Hall, if you didn't know, uh, is named after Sir Martin Frobisher, who was an English navigator in the 16th century who, amongst many other things, explored uh, Canada's eastern Arctic um, in search of new trade routes. It's a metaphor. Um, no, no, it's not. <laughs> he didn't find them. But uh, anyways, back to the, back to the text. Um, uh, his connection to the Barbican, the reason this is called Frobisher Hall, is that most of him is actually buried uh, beneath here, uh, in, or buried in St. Giles in the Fields uh, churchyards. I say most of them because apparently his heart and entrails are elsewhere uh, in St. Andrews in Plymouth. Um, he's probably more famous uh, in Canada. Certainly he's famous enough that when I saw that this was Frobisher Hall, I went to check to see if it was because of him. Um, and one of the great bays in uh, the Eastern Arctic um, is called Frobisher Bay, and on Frobisher Bay is a Callowit. Uh, which is the capital of Nunavut, um, and some of you will remember, uh, some of you were there uh, from the press, um, was the host, uh, it hosted the G7 uh, nine years ago this month, uh, to give you a sense of the temperature, uh, so think Arctic Circle, <laughs> February, Canada, G7. Um, and what did we talk about? Uh, we talked about Greece, uh, because nine years ago, this was the start of the Euro crisis. Um, and uh, in my Everything is Connected, you know, those events, uh, the causes of those events are reverberating uh, still uh, today here, including in the environs of the Barbican. Um, now, the uh, debate and the focus in the UK has been a little more inward uh, of late, uh, uh, understandably, um, uh, focused on uh, Brexit. Um, but while we've been doing that, the world's been otherwise engaged, and I want to spend most of my time talking about the uh, global outlook uh, today. Um, just taking a step back, when the referendum was held, the global economy was emerging from a long period of financial repair and lackluster growth. Um, over the next two years, a widespread and increasingly vigorous expansion took hold. For the first time since the crisis, business investment and foreign trade grew strongly across all major regions, economic uncertainty diminished, confidence firmed, real wages began to rise, and a new beginning uh, seemed possible. In the past few quarters, however, these trends have largely reversed. After peaking a year ago, global momentum is now weakening in all major regions, and downside risks have intensified. The proportion of the global economy growing ab above trend has fallen from four-fifths so a year ago, four-fifths of the world was growing above trend. It's now only a third. Trade growth has slowed. Capital goods orders are stagnating. Investment growth has become more tepid. And business confidence uh, everywhere is diminished. In part, uh, that deceleration of the global economy reflects the shift from accommodative to tighter financial conditions that occurred initially in emerging economies, then in most advanced economies, and then finally towards the end of the year uh, sharply in the United States. Last year, as many of you would know uh, from personal experience, uh, returns on all major asset classes uh, were negative and cash was once again king. The tightening of those financial conditions globally reflected in part the usual, if somewhat delayed, response to uh, the tightening of monetary policy. Over the past year, uh, the withdrawal of monetary accommodation gathered pace the Fed obviously raised rates four times, and the Bank of England and 10 other G20 central banks also tightened policy. <coughs> As well, new government borrowing outweighed central bank purchases uh, for the first time in several years and actually outweighed them by more than a trillion dollars for the first time since 2012. Potentially more seriously, the slowing in global momentum may also be the product of growing policy uncertainty and rising trade tensions. And given the broad-based slowdown and the rise in downside risk, some are beginning to wonder whether the global expansion, which began in 2010, the time of the uh, G7 in Iqaluit, uh could be starting to end. Now, 
Uh, I think we know that recessions are notoriously difficult to predict. The IMF has anticipated only a sixth of the over 300 recessions that have happened in member countries since 1991. Uh, Financial markets are a little more likely to cry wolf um, than to miss it, uh, making Paul Samuelson's observation that is now half a century old, uh, his observation that uh, the stock market has predicted nine out of the last uh, five recessions, uh, it's still apt today. And for what it's worth, uh, market implied probabilities of a U.S. recession have tripled uh, over the course of the last year, but tripled to about 20 percent uh, today. Um, now, to assess whether uh, recent developments in the global economy represent a soft patch or herald renewed uh, stagnation, um, I'm going to consider uh, the world's position relative to three cycles, uh, the business cycle, the financial cycle, and what I'll call the cycle of globalization. And in each of these, uh, imbalances can build uh, that herald uh, each of the cycle's demise. So starting with the business cycle, the most conventional, um, the, uh, the business cycle can be uh, at first amplified uh, and then imperiled by growing imbalances in the real economy, such as overinvestment in capital or housing, uh, debt-fueled consumption, or particularly in emerging economies, uh, the building of excess uh, current account imbalances. But of course, imbalances can also uh, manifest themselves in inflation. And in the advanced economies, in wage pressures have picked up as slack has been absorbed. For example, in the UK, private sector wage growth has increased from 2 percent three years ago to 2.5 percent last year to 3.5 percent today. All of this suggesting that the Phillips curve is alive and well, if not particularly steeply uh, sloped. And what we're seeing is that those, that pickup of wages is slowly feeding in uh, to core inflation, which is now close to 2 percent in both the US and the UK. Globally, uh, inflation, inflation pressures have moderated as commodity prices have fallen back, consistent with that uh, reduction in global momentum and the emergence of some slack in a range of economies. As a consequence, financial markets now expect more accommodative uh, monetary policy than previously in all major economic areas, and some central banks, most notably the People's Bank of China, have taken a number of measures to ease uh, policy. Now, Provided the expansion continues, a modest tightening of monetary policy over time will likely be sufficient to achieve inflation targets. In other words, policy can remain limited and gradual and data dependent. Um, and both of those phrases, uh, catchphrases, are guides uh, to monetary policy which reflect the historically low level of the equilibrium interest rate, or R star. As, as the Bank of England has long emphasized, there are a number of forces that have been depressing R star, and it's a view uh, that we think has been validated by the muted performance of inflation over the past several years. The Fed has observed recently that incoming data for them will help provide important information about the actual evolution of the equilibrium rate, and I'll come back to this issue. In the MPC's projections published last week, the balance of headwinds to growth and uh, the more accommodative stance of global monetary policy are expected to return global growth to around potential rates by the end of the year. And this, in our view, uh, and I agree with this, is the most likely scenario unless there are shocks from the other two cycles. So let me turn uh, to the financial cycle. Actually, imbalances in the financial cycle have been the best predictors of downturns in recent decades. And there's a range of indicators that are monitored by bodies such as the Financial Policy Committee of the bank um, who use, uh, then use a range of tools uh, to cut off excesses uh, in, uh, at source before they affect wider economic prospects. Research at the bank and elsewhere finds that private sector credit growth is amongst the best early warning indicators of a downturn. Over half of the recessions um, are, pre are preceded by private credit booms, and within advanced economies, two-thirds of pri private credit booms end in recessions. And even if private debt is not the proximate cause, it can be the vulnerability that turns a shock into slump. Now, at present, um, aggregate private financial balances in advanced economies do not appear large enough on their own to tip global activity from slowing to stalling. 
Private credit growth has averaged less than 3% in the U.S. and the U.K. and Euro area over the past decade, so generally a rate less than the growth of nominal GDP. In other words, people have deleveraged. Aggregate debt service ratios are now well below historic averages, in part due to that low equilibrium interest rate. So although there are pockets of risk, heat maps that, uh, such as these that mechanically bring together several of the key credit uh, measures remain relatively cool overall, though the aggregates can uh, hide uh, important pockets, as I said, uh, and it's a different picture, as you see at the bottom of each of those bars uh, for China. Digging a little deeper, since the crisis, households have delevered by an average of 11 percentage points in major advanced economies and by 20 percentage points in the UK. Um, interest rates would have to rise to three by sorry would have to rise by three per percentage points in order to return debt service ratios in the UK back to historic averages. Now, corporate debt across advanced economy is more of a concern, particularly in the United States. Like households, uh, corporations <coughs> repaired their balance sheets in the immediate aftermath of the crisis, but unlike households, they then went back to the well. Relative to earnings, aggregate corporate debt in the U.S. and the U.K. is nearing pre-crisis peaks, and the distribution is worsening. Globally, the average credit quality of corporate borrowers has deteriorated. The share of low lower-rated debt uh, in global corporate bond markets has increased significantly, with triple B rated bonds now about half of that market compared to a quarter uh, in 2007. The global leveraged lending market grew by 20% in 2018. At 2.3 trillion, the stock of outstanding leveraged loans is double that of subprime in 2007. 60% of these loans are covenant light. Most deals have substantial addbacks of EBITDA, developments analogous to no doc, no income uh, in the subprime heyday. And to add to the sense of deja vu, uh, an increasing proportion of leveraged loans are securitized. But there are some important differences. Um, Non-banks play a much smaller role in origination these days, and skin in the game rules have, up until recently, um, aligned the incentives between originators and holders. And in that regard, it's regret regrettable that that requirement has been now rolled back in the United States, where 85 percent of CLOs are structured. Most fundamentally, though, um, the holders of leveraged loans can generally bear the risks. For CLOs, the riskiest tranches are concentrated in hedge funds, open-ended funds, and structured credit funds, and CLO managers. So there's no sieves, asset-backed commercial papers, uh, vehicles that um, had fundamental maturity mismatches, uh, uh, which was the case uh, with subprime. U.S. banks and insurers hold around a third of CLOs, usually the less risky tranches, compared to only 6% for European firms and only 2% for UK banks. This specific point uh, highlights a more general one, uh, which is the progress that has been made in proving the resilience of the core of the financial system. Banks in most regions are now more likely to be stabilizers than amplifiers, um, uh, and that's particularly the case in the United Kingdom today with the core banks having CET1 ratios of 15 percent, more than three times pre-crisis pre levels, and liquidity, on balance sheet liquidity, of more than a trillion dollars, four times uh, uh, the level prior to the crisis. So story thus far, there are pockets of risk. Global growth is still decelerating. But overall, the combination of the policy response and the state of current imbalances in advanced economies suggests the global growth is more likely than not to stabilize eventually around its new modest trend of about three and a quarter uh, percent. But obviously this is a judgment, not a guarantee. Not that anyone will remember that line, but I'd just like to, I'm going to repeat that. It's a judgment, not a guarantee. Um, the world is in a delicate equilibrium. Business and consumer confidence are being buffeted by policy uncertainty. And the sustainability of those debt burdens uh, depends on interest rates <laughs> remaining low and global trade remaining open. And I'd now like to turn to three uh, risks that are on the horizon. And the first um, is, that, is the risk of complacency. 
Um, paradoxically, if uh, the expansion is prolonged, uh, that could make its demise both more likely and more painful when it happens. The frequency of financial crises over history is partly because memories fade, financial lobbies are powerful, and the cost of backsliding on financial reforms are invisible, at least at first. When it comes to financial stability, failure, not success, is an orphan. Success, not failure, is an orphan, sorry. Um, the G20 countries bear a heavy responsibility to safeguard progress by discipline implementation of their agreed reforms. And policymakers, such as the FPC of the bank, must remain vig vigilant to address new risks as they arise. The lessons of subprime do bear recalling in one sense. Subprime mortgages emerged in the mid-1990s as an innovation, a true innovation, to expand home ownership to those who had been unfairly excluded from it. But subprime eventually grew unchecked until the mortgages written in 2006 and 2007 were twice as likely to default as those written uh, a few years before. It's the end that it's the last years of the boom that get you. It's, such, it's just such a descent from responsible to reckless underwriting that we must avoid today. And that's why the FPC has acted to limit the share of high loan to income mortgages that UK banks can originate. The PRA has tightened uh, standards. It's why they have already tightened standards on consumer credit. And it's why the bank is monitoring closely the growth in leveraged lending. Now, the second reason for caution is the possibility of a more material slowdown in China. China is the one major economy in which all major financial imbalances have materially worsened. It may be the exception uh, that proves the rule. Well, the Chinese economic miracle over the past three decades has been extraordinary. Its post-crisis performance has increasingly relied on one of the largest and longest-running credit booms ever with an associated expansion of shadow banking. Total social financing has increased from 120 to 225 percent of GDP since 2008. And in parallel, the non-bank financial sector has increased from around 20 percent of GDP to over 70 percent today. Chinese authorities have begun to take measures to manage these risks. Growth in total social financing is now in line with that of nominal GDP. Shadow banking is being restructured. But there's a tension between reducing the risk from high debt and supporting the economy. A downturn in the Chinese economy would test the resilience of elsewhere, not least because China's contribution to global growth has risen from one-fifth to one-third since the last Fed tightening cycle. And to give a sense of the issue, in the 21 credit booms that match the scale of China's since 1975, annual growth in the economies that had those credit booms dropped by three and a half percentage points on average in subsequent years. Adjusting for the progress that's been made thus far in China, this alone suggests a further slowing of one to one and a half percentage points. And of course, deeper trade tensions could worsen the slowdown. The Bank of England estimates that a 3% drop in Chinese GDP, in the pace of growth of Chinese GDP, I should say, would knock one percentage point off UK activity, off global activity, and half a percentage point off UK activity. So 3% China slowing, 1% off global activity, uh, and half a percent off UK growth. Now, my final caution relates to uh, the future of globalization. If you recall at the start, I tried to say three cycles, business, financial, and cycle of globalization. Um, and in many respects, the trade tensions uh, abroad and the Brexit debates at home are manifestations of fundamental pressures to reorder uh, the nature of globalization. And it is possible that new rules of the road will be developed for a more inclusive and resilient global economy. At the same time, there's a risk that countries turn inwards, undercutting growth and prosperity for all. Concerns over this possibility are, are already impairing investment, jobs, and growth creating a dynamic that could become self-fulfilling. It has to be recognized that while the current cycle of globalization has brought widespread prosperity, it's also given rise to three imbalances that threaten its sustainability. First, there are external imbalances. And if you sum up the 
uh, deficits and surplus, uh, if you sum up the deficits, um, globally you get to about 2% of GDP, which is significant. The sustainability of those imbalances is made more challenging by a, what's a growing asymmetry at the heart of the global economy, namely the reordering of the real economy with the rise of emerging economies from 40 to 60 percent of global activity since the crisis, but the still dominant position of the U.S. Uh, dollar. This contributes economically to higher risks of sudden stops and politically to greater mercantilist pressures. The second imbalance around globalization is imbalances of income and wealth in many countries. Amongst economists, a belief in free trade is totemic, but while trade makes countries better off, it does not raise all boats within them. Rather, the benefits from trade are spread unequally across individuals and time. Consumers get lower prices and greater choice, and eventually more benefits from higher productivity. Um, some workers, however, lose their jobs, the dignity of work, or they see their, in economist uh, terms, their factor prices equalized, uh, or in plain English, their wages fall. Such dynamics are felt at either end uh, of the great convergence. So survey evidence shows that 70% of Chinese workers believe that trade creates jobs and increases wages. 70% of U.S. households think exactly the opposite. U.K. public opinion is in the middle. The third imbalance of globalization is one of democracy and sovereignty. Um, and this is what uh, contributes to a sense of loss of control uh, and loss of trust in the system. Danny Roderick has argued that there's a trilemma between economic integration, democracy, and sovereignty common rules and standards that are required for trade in goods, services, and capital, um, those rules uh, require some seeding or at best pooling of sovereignty. And to maintain legitimacy, the process of agreeing those standards needs to be rooted in democratic accountability. So there's a lot that will be required to create a more in inclusive and sustainable globalization. I just want to mention quickly before concluding that part of the solution in the opinion of the bank, is a more flexible and open trading system for services and small uh, business. Freer trade in services can help reduce those external imbalances. Our calculations are that if we were to reduce trade barriers on services across the G20 to the same degree that uh, barriers on goods have been reduced over the course of the last two decades, if we do the same, that would cut excess imbalances uh, for the U.S by a third, and by the UK, by a half. Free trade and services would also spread the benefits of global markets much more widely than traditional, more multinational-based free trade in goods. After all, SMEs uh, employ 60% of workers, and more women work in services than men. And free trade and services could also help rebalance that trilemma from moving from prescriptive supranational rules to more differentiated national approaches to achieve common outcomes. I'd like to argue that the post-crisis reforms of, uh, of the financial sector offer a possible model. The G20, as you know, have agreed a wide range of reforms over the last decade um, and put in place mechanisms for deep supervisory cooperation. And these so-called FSB reforms create a platform for cross-border financial services between systems that have different uh, uh, legal systems um, and regulatory approaches. The standard is to achieve similar outcomes, including for financial stability. Doing so avoids unnecessary duplication and costly fragmentation while promoting greater competition, enhanced resilience, and improved efficiency for all our citizens. Okay, so uh, to conclude. Although um, the economic and financial imbalances in the global economy do not yet appear to contain the seeds of their own demise, global momentum is softening. Monetary policymakers will need to be disciplined and macroprudential authorities vigilant. Risks from China and deglobalization are significant and growing, and I think the question is, is this how the expansion could end? Protectionism is already having an impact. Last year, trade growth lagged the growth of global activity, and current global export PMIs 
signal an outright contraction in trade. Bank of England simulations suggest that an increase in tariffs of 10 percentage points between the U.S. and the rest of, of the world would take 2.5% off U.S. output and a point off global output through trade channels alone. If business confidence and financial uh, conditions are also effective, these impacts could double. And there are signs that concerns about just such a possibility are beginning to cascade through economies via reduced investment and demand. And consider the UK as a leading indicator of a nascent global trend. UK business investment has now fallen 3.7% over the past year, despite an ongoing expansion, high business profitability, and accommodative financial conditions. With fundamental uncertainty about future market access, UK investment hasn't grown since the referendum was called and has dramatically underperformed both history and its peers. Similarly, a prolongation of global trade uncertainty could undermine the global expansion. And that impact would be magnified if financial markets move such a possibility from their tail risks towards their central scenarios. Most fundamentally, the larger and more permanent the disruption of global trade, the greater the reduction in both activity and supply capacity of economies. A material hit to supply is something that advanced economies have not seen since the mid-1970s. In this scenario, a combination of slower growth, smaller surpluses in Asia, and higher risk premia could move global, global interest rates higher, increasing the burden of corporate and household debt and challenging the creditworthiness of some sovereigns. So contrary to what you might have heard, it's not easy to win a trade war. If the UK, I'll finish where I started, if the UK has been somewhat more inwardly focused of late, it's been for good reason. In many respects, Brexit is the first test of the new global order, and it could prove the acid test of whether a way can be found to broaden the benefits of openness while enhancing democratic accountability. Brexit can lead to new forms of international cooperation and cross-border commerce built on a better balance of local and supranational authorities. In these respects, Brexit could affect both the short and long-term global outlooks. So it's in the interests of everyone, arguably everywhere, from Frobisher's grave to Frobisher's bay, that a Brexit solution is found that works for all. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Governor, for an illuminating speech. Um, it seems like you're saying that uh, Britain is really the canary in the coal mine for the new global <coughs> order, and it's not going that well in Britain at the moment. What does this tell you about the world as, it, as we move ahead? Well, um, I mean, yeah, the bird may be towards the bottom of the cage, but it's still, still fluttering. Um, and uh, <laughs> the, look, I, I think the issues, what, what I'm, I'm trying to say is that it is a leading indicator. Um, many of the issues that uh, are brought to the fore through uh, Brexit are, are, are being felt elsewhere and uh, are likely to manifest over time elsewhere. And uh, the, the challenge is to determine um, rules for the trades of goods, rules for the trades of services, whether there's a difference between, uh, between the two, um, what rules are made locally, what rules are pooled uh, nationally. Um, and uh, the fundamental issues at the heart of the Brexit discussions, not so much about the withdrawal agreement, but the future political arrangement, um, are the issues that the global economy needs to grapple with. Um, I think the challenge is, uh, when, again, taking a global perspective to it, is um, it will be of some deep concern if the UK and the EU cannot come to an agreement um, around these issues. Um, it won't be a very good leading indicator, very good signal about the ability of other jurisdictions to, uh, 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 to come, come to these arrangements. Um, so. Uh, there's a lot of focus on this, um, and uh, it matters very much for the city, for the UK, but it also matters for the world. And you, in, in your speech, you asked yourself a rhetorical question. You asked yourself in, in this, is this how the global expansion ends? I'm going to ask you that directly. 
uh, and try and give you a, a, a straight answer. Is this how the global expansion ends? Is it global conflicts? Well, is that the biggest risk that yeah, is I, out there? I appreciate the direct question because I think if I've got to land on something, this is the dynamic that has the potential to end the global uh, expansion. Uh, because what, from where we see it, the imbalances in the business cycle globally, and there's many engines of growth globally, are, are, are not extreme. Um, there are pockets of risks uh, in the financial sector. They need to be addressed. The people, uh, authorities need to be vigilant. But again, they are not in a position that should be uh, about to tip um, uh, slowing into stalling. Um, but uh, the dynamic, the questions about the openness of markets, market access, the consequence of that for business investment, business confidence, that has the potential, and we're seeing some signs of it, to, um, um, to uh, move us out of this uh, relatively delicate equilibrium. So uh, where we sit today, yes, it's the most likely candidate. Okay, with that, if you could put up your hand if you want to ask a question. Uh, there's some roving mics just there in the, in the, right by the mic, yes, please. If you could say who you are and your affiliation yeah. as well, please. Hello, thank you so much indeed. Um, sorry, I was a bit late. Uh, Bob Seeley, Member of Parliament for the Isle of Wight. I suspect we're going to differ over Brexit, so I'm not talking about the politics of it. But I think the point is that, correct me if I'm wrong, because we have our own currency and we still control many of the levers of our own economy, and the overwhelming majority of our economy is either domestic or global non-EU, we can take a hit on the European Union or not, and it would be great if there was a deal, but actually we still control, to a very considerable extent, our own economic destiny, and we, can, we have many tools that you and the Chancellor have to encourage and stimulate investment, both globally and in our own economy. Is that still correct in your opinion? Thank you. Um, well, there's several things in that. Um, I, I don't know if we differ or not, and you'll never know what my opinion is on Brexit because I'm not going to. I'm not going to disclose it. You, as an MP, have to disclose uh, uh, your your view. Um, the just break a few of those things down. Absolutely, we have many tools, and there's many strengths of this economy. And we, at, going into this situation, um, uh, whether it's uh, household balance sheets, corporate balance sheets. Uh, uh, the readiness of the financial sector for whatever happens, all of those, uh, plus the historic strengths of the United Kingdom, which are legion, um, uh, are very much uh, in the UK's favor. Uh, I think one thing I, I, I would caution on, on two points, though, which is that um, the currency, um, having the currency adjust because the fundamental earnings prospects or income prospects of the country have been marked down in relative terms. Yes, that's part of the natural adjustment mechanism, but that's not a step towards prosperity. It is, it, it is a hit to income. So what has happened to the currency since, uh, since the referendum was caused, called um, uh, the 15% decline in the currency is a view of the market um, that uh, UK relative incomes um, are going to be lower uh, for some time. Um, and what one sees, and we have to see what kind of uh, deal is struck in the end, um, but uh, deals that have less access, uh, market positioning implies a further markdown of relative uh, income prospects. So yes, that it, it brings more competitiveness at a new level, but it's a new lower level of income. Um, and then the second thing, which I'm almost, I apologize for inserting this into an answer to a broader question, but I'm sort of duty bound to say as a member of the MPC, and it's important, uh, is that it's not clear uh, the direction of uh, monetary policy uh, if there is a hard Brexit. Uh, if, uh, because in the end, we will have uh, some conflicting forces. We will have, for a period of time, a reduction in the supply capacity of the economy. We would expect lower demand, not least because what still is our largest trading partner, would uh, uh, there would be lower demand from the EU. Um, and the exchange rate would adjust. And the net of that um, could quite well be inflationary, inflationary for a period of time. Um, now, that's not a, that's, as, as people know, um, there's a lot of subtleties around that. And we're not saying that definitely uh, implies uh, a tightening of policy. But we do want to put uh, people on notice that, um, this is a different situation 
than what had happened, what normally has happened through uh, judging from your young age, all of our professional lifetimes, which is that hits to the economy have been largely hits to demand. This is actually, for a period of time, a hit to supply. In the fullness of time, you know, a new uh, outward-looking economy, uh, developing new, uh, um, uh, new trade relationships, maybe through the Northwest Passage, I don't know, um, <laughs> maybe uh, you know, through, uh, through other innovation, uh, things can change. So it's not a judgment of the bank about the long-term uh, prospects uh, for Brexit, but certainly in the short term, uh, there will be a hit to incomes. Ed Conway in the fourth row. Thank you. Um, Ed Conway from Sky News. Governor, I was struck, um, as I'm sure many others were, by your point about Brexit being a kind of acid test for, for this new global order. Uh, and I just want a, a couple of points on that. First of all, can, could you say whether this is a kind of a necessary cathartic experience for the UK to be going through, given that it, it is kind of associated with the, the build-up of uh, those concerns that you talked about, imbalances and inequalities and so on. And secondly, is it, is it too early at this stage to say whether it, this is a moment, an act of protectionism, given what we know about the deal that's, that's been struck or that, that's, you know, to some extent been struck, um, or in the opposite direction, is it a kind of act of liberalisation? Yeah, I, I, I mean, outright dodged the first one because um, it's, it's not really my position to you know, look into the hearts of the entire country and determine um, uh, why we are where we are. Um, but on the second one, uh, look, the intention of, certainly the intention of um, the uh, withdrawal agreement and the political uh, uh, political declaration that was uh, was negotiated um, uh, is is one of openness. Um, the policy of the government is uh, is one of openness uh, more broadly, um, and it. So I and I think most of the, if I could characterize it this, most of the options that are debated, um, and there's obviously a very wide range of opinions, are around different forms of openness, um, and 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 the the question is what is what is best. The point, one of the points in terms of the asset test here, which is around, so if we take, let's take financial services, where I'm on the safest ground, um, and uh, there are not many examples, in fact, there are no real examples of uh, free trade agreements uh, for financial services. Uh, the only example actually is uh, the European Union itself. And the question is, um, if you step back from that, um, what's the model for free trade and financial services? Is it to be a rule taker for someone else, uh, from someone else's rules, and actually have them oversee your, your financial sector in order to have access? Or is it to have agreed uh, outcomes, high levels of outcome, broad approaches that are agreed, which by the way have been agreed at the FSB and the G20 and endorsed, and use those as uh, the platform uh, for cross-border access. And the point, and I'll just finish quickly, is that that um, both is, in our judgment, a more practical uh, approach for trade and services, including financial services. It is what the G20 reforms were about. Um, and it also has a greater degree of um, democratic accountability um, and arguably legitimacy because in the end, you're responsible, you take primary responsible for your rules. Now, it hasn't been done, um, but that's one of the reasons why, I would say, and, and, and last point on it, given the starting position, it's one of the reasons why the form of Brexit um, could send quite a positive signal in terms of how the collective we should structure uh, trade and services, which, as I've argued, is one of the solutions to a more inclusive globalization. The woman just by on the aisle, just two rows back, with the orange scarf. Thank you. Thank you. Elina Rabakova Bruegel, what is your take on the WTO? Because in case of the hard Brexit, we'll fall back to the WTO rules. There is no more dispute resolution body, possibly by the end of the year, as the remaining two of the three judges retire. So then what is the plan, in your view? Um, well, um, there, there are challenges with the WTO, as you just uh, alluded uh, to. Uh, there is 
a high-level intention, uh, including the Buenos Aires G20 for reform of elements of the WTO, including, very importantly, dispute resolution. Um, I know the Secretary General is very focused on trying to build on the Ottawa, uh, informal discussions in Ottawa uh, on that. Um, but it remains to be seen. Um, and it goes again, I mean, I think your question, uh, bring it up to the highest level, it goes back to this issue about how globalization is going to be reordered. How, how, does, how do we rely on, for what are countries willing, what supranational bodies are countries willing to rely on? Um, and which rules can be at the, at the global level, uh, how they're tailored domestically. Um, to be positive about it, um, now that it's been put on the table, uh, reform and dispute resolution, um, there is an opportunity to refound uh, those rules, recommit to them, I mean, change them and recommit to them. Uh, but I don't, I, it's an open, it, it, I mean, I think everyone recognizes that it will be a very difficult process to, uh, to pull off. Andy Verity. Mr. Carney, there were 20 mentions of the word recession in your speech. <laughs> Someone's been counting. Yeah. Excellent. Do you believe that the risk of a recession here in the UK has been higher in your time as governor? Uh, Look, it's um, there. There are risks. Um, there's no question. There's risks. Um, but I think one of the things that we stressed last week when we put out our forecast, um, and I'd stress today, is that we have expected um, to use the euphemism short-term volatility in the data, um, and it's for reasons that I think we all recognize. Uh, there is very high level of uncertainty of the degree of access that companies are going to have um, in the next two months, um, which is quite an extraordinary situation to be in. Um, and quite logically, rationally, understandably, um, they are holding back on making bigger decisions, bigger investment decisions. Um, uh, those who have contingency plans are putting them in place, but many countries, and we know this from talking to the businesses, surveying them, others know this, uh, many uh, companies cannot self-insure against uh, this, this possibility. So while this is going on, there is a natural, um, uh, uh, there is a natural volatility to the data. And I don't think we would read too much into, as the bank, as a policy setting committee, into the short-term numbers. I mean, obviously, we obsess over them, but we don't you know, extrapolate from those to where the economy is going. Which, and I'll finish on this, which is why in the forecast we put out last week, on the assumption that there is a deal, uh, we think that this uh, extreme uncertainty obviously gradually dissipates, uh, business investment uh, picks up uh, from a very low base, as you would have just seen, um, and, uh, and the economy grows, uh, grows more strongly towards the end of the year. But that's a big assumption. With the rather ropey figures that came out yesterday, hmm. How much does that change, in your mind, the outlook you put out just a few days ago? No, last I, 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 yeah, I, not, not, a, not a great deal. I think uh, the figures yesterday were broadly consistent. I mean, they were 0.1 lower than what we had uh, our, our very short-term forecast. Um, that's, that's, in the, that's kind of in the rounding, if you will, in terms of uh, revisions of data, as you would know. Um, weakness in business investment. Uh, uh, relatively weak trade, as we had expected, the household sector holding up, softening in housing, uh, overall housing expenditure. Again, big, big ticket items um, uh, all pulling back. Um, it certainly doesn't suggest that the economy has more momentum than we expected, but directionally, um, both the figures and the composition uh, broadly consistent. Um, what, it, what it shows. Um, what those figures show, uh, I'd argue what our forecast shows, what the historic performance shows, is that there is a need for certainty. There is a need for certainty of where the country is going. Um, and I would, I would add, um, uh, given the degree of preparation of businesses and the infrastructure of the country, with the exception of the financial sector, virtual exception of the financial sector, there are a few other sectors that are relatively ready, uh, it underscores the importance of a transition to whatever um, uh, end state uh, uh, that parliament, uh, parliament decides. And if you'd like to uh, 
get your uh, vote in. There's a representative uh, here today who will take, take, take your views. I think we've got time for a couple more questions. There's a gentleman just there with the grey hair. Yes, please. Um, Mark, excellent. Um, I was talking to a 95-year-old the other day, and he said, you don't know how lucky you are in the last 20, 30 years. And we had uh, the world coming together. We had NAFTA, we had European Union, and so on. Do you think that underpinning all this is the world's actually going the other way now? Um, mistrust, we've got all that underpinning uh, this uh, kind of uh, issues at hand everywhere. Um, and the second thing, China bailed us out in 2001 and 2008, and I heard that uh, from friends in China, I lived there for seven years, that they're not going to bail us out this time, and that's another issue. Thank yeah. You. Uh, I'll take the last. They're not going to bail us out this time. I absolutely agree. Uh, and in fact, what, what has shifted is to the, you know, the one-third of global growth contribution that um, half a point, a point difference in growth in China is going to matter. Um, and the, I think the effort of the Chinese authorities broadly, um, uh, given a series of transitions um, in that economy and that financial sector, is going to be to try to stabilize uh, growth around a sort of 6%, maybe, maybe even slightly, slightly below that. Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's, a different, uh, that's a different environment with some, with some uh, it, as you would have heard, with some downside risk to, uh, to that. Um, in terms, of, uh, in terms of trust, there, look, there, there are issues of trust. Um, one of the things I've been struck um, in the almost six years I've been here has been uh, going around the country is just the degree of mistrust uh, in, the, um, in the financial sector. I mean, very raw emotions still uh, around that. And um, it's, why, uh, it's why we have to finish the work on ending too big to fail. Uh, it's why the financial sector, whatever happens, whatever agreement is struck, has to perform uh, and, and be part of the solution, not, not adding to the problem uh, with, uh, uh, you know, as, as deglobalization proceeds. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is, is, is kind of go back to what I tried to say in the speech, which is that the structure, you know, some of these structures of globalization, we have to, we really do have to think about um, where we're setting the rules, how you tailor to local circumstances, what the process is, and, and who's actually benefiting. And I'll just finish on this. I mean, there have been five, you know, four or five rounds of uh, trade, uh, multiple plurilateral deals, trade deals. Um, but they're, you know, they're pretty big business heavy in terms of their, which, is, which has great benefit as well. Um, but there's not, you know, not a lot of focus on services, which touches much more the economy, uh, or certainly, and it's very easy to say, um, but sometimes it's, well, it's always easy as a central banker to say the easy thing, so I'll say it, but, you know, free trade for small, medium-sized enterprises up to a threshold, pull many more parts of the economy, include geography and sectors, into openness, and then you start to, over time, build back some trust. So the woman down in the second row, with the classes. Thanks very much. I'm Tina Fordham, uh, Chief Political Analyst at City. First of all, thanks, Governor Carney, for your leadership. And uh, it's hard to be in the hot seat um, taking all these kinds of questions. Uh, I wanted to go a little bit off piste, um, very macroeconomic. Uh, I've been involved with the United Nations High Level Panel on Women's Economic Empowerment, which the UK government sponsored, in yeah. fact. And one of the things that we looked at was how lowering uh, barriers to entry for women in the labor force can actually produce pretty significant growth dividends. And so one thing I wonder about, regardless of what type of Brexit we have, uh, or if we never have Brexit, whether the bank has looked at this and how the UK can do what Canada did so well, in fact, really realizing some benefits, uh, growth benefits from policy tweaks. Um, and then, again, kind of being, you know, kind of neutral about Brexit and, and how it transpires, um, how aging democracies like we mm. have in Western Europe can um, fuel growth and competitiveness through policy, or do we end up being, as uh, my former colleague Bob Rubin used to say to me, uh, one of the museum economies of Europe? Thank Ouch. you. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
Okay, two, uh, two great questions. Uh, we're very off-piste uh, from, well, we're not, actually, we're not very off-piste because I think this, uh, yeah, actually, uh, certainly the first is part of, is, is part of, the, uh, is part of the answer. Um, and it's part of the answer for the second as well because it's what gives you um, more potential growth, you know, uh, greater labor force participation. Um, you know, I'd say from our perspective, um, one of, this is one of the issues, we look at it from a, what's actually going to happen as opposed to specific policy interventions outside of the financial sector, I'll come to those quickly. Um, we look at what's going to happen uh, in terms of um, uh, the overall labor force, as I say, labor force participation, where the record is better but not um, quite, not quite Canadian, let's say, at this stage, but headed, aspirate, well, well it's head, I mean, it's headed, uh, it's headed in the right direction. And certainly we have been uh, collectively, uh, you know, surprised on the upside in terms of participation in the last several years. Big issue, um, and actually, um, well, big issue is in finance um, in terms of uh, uh, women, uh, female participation in finance, um, how to get that up. And we have taken a view, if I can bring it down to the micro, uh, in our responsibilities at the Bank of England to, um, it, it, to try to lead on this. Many reasons, part of it, think group think and cognitive diversity, diversity of perspectives get, uh, uh, making a real difference. Um, you know, our bottom line, we've gone from, of our senior management, uh, gone from 17 to 32 percent over the course of the last five years, uh, uh, female um, uh, senior management uh, with an aim to get it at 35 by the end of, um, uh, in another uh, 15 months uh, time. Um, and that has actually helped really reinforce a cultural change um, in the institution, uh, just in terms of challenge, inclusive decision making, diversity of opinion, all, all those sorts of uh, good things. So uh, that plus uh, participation women in finance and others, it's, it's a way to get across this dividend. I think for Europe, writ large, the aging economies, Canada's one of them as well. Um, this, this is, that's part of the answer. Um, I'll, maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll hold it there so we can do one more. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Kate Allen, down in the front. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Carney. Um, Kate Allen, Financial Times. Um, this is relevant both to Brexit and to your wider theme of what's going on in the, in the global economy and, and with public sentiment as well. Uh, the bank's spoken a lot about the risks of a no-deal Brexit. Um, are MPs and members of the public simply choosing not to listen to you, or do they just not care what economists think? Uh, look, I mean, why, why do we... Um, we've spoken about the risks of a no-deal Brexit because we have a responsibility to be ready for a no-deal uh, Brexit. Um, and um, as, as the regulator of the core of the financial sector and the, and the macro prudential authority. So the first thing is you've got to, you've got to be clear what you're getting ready for. Um, and um, you can't look at the, oh, everything, it'll all be all right on the night type approach, everything will go fine. It's what could be the worst case of that. And that's why we've, um, that's why we did these stress tests. Um, that's why, um, w you know, banks have liquidity quad quadrupled. That's why they're on daily liquidity monitoring. It's why UK banks can be out of the market for a year if they need to. They're not going to need to, but they could. Um, which is an extraordinary position to be in going into something uh, like this. Uh, and it's why, and you know, it's why I extended my term, so I'll be around to kind of bear the consequences if, uh, if we haven't gotten it, gotten it right. So, you know, we're, we're putting ourselves uh, on the line for it. Um, yeah, and you have to recognize that actually this could go quite badly. And, you know, I don't think, you know, we're 45 days before um, the possibility of it. Um, we think the financial sector, and I, I, I should take this opportunity to commend those in the financial sector, um, in the city particularly, who have done a tremendous amount of work to get ready as well uh, from day one. And so, uh, and, and I think in, in a small way it goes back to the, to the trust point um, uh, in that uh, they have taken their responsibility city. Seriously, um, but we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't be on any illusions. I'm not going to put a point estimate on it, um, but a no deal, no transition Brexit would uh, be an economic shock for this economy. Um, and it would have, and I'll 
kind of loop it back to the speech, it would also send a signal globally um, about um, uh, the prospects of, uh, of, of you know, refounding globalization. Um, and that would be very unfortunate given um, the intentions of both parties in this uh, is, is to come to a very different place. Well, I think we're unfortunately out of time now. Thank you, Governor, for an extremely illuminating and thoughtful sort of melding together both the domestic situation we are in as a, as a nation and how that applies to the world more generally. If anyone can give the Governor a huge round of applause, please. Thank you very much.